Hi, everyone. I'm Taylor. Um, I'm in the Pulmonary Club, which uh, this is the first meeting where we actually have some Pulmonary students. Oh, oh, sorry, Kevin was until recently. And so, um, just want to say welcome to you guys, and uh, hopefully, everyone in the room will get to meet you guys at some point. Um, anyways, so yeah, so we're just going to do a quick recap of some of the talks we found interesting at C. Um, and so just to give you an overview, so these were the main session topics. Um, I do actually have a PDF of the program if anybody is interested in like looking at abstracts and stuff. Um, I can give, have them send out my email at the end. But yeah, so we talked about uh, program translation. There was some mm -hmm. talking about mammalian cells, cell free systems, plants. Uh, of course, a whole session on genome editing, which is a lot of CRISPR, um, which always seems to be a lot of CRISPR. Um, and uh, bio design and automation, and engineering design means evolution. <coughs> So I want to focus uh, briefly, because I think everyone else is doing more of a research talk, on the session that was on an emerging symbio industry. Um, so we had seven or eight, I think, 15-minute talks from different industry professionals who have companies that either are using synthetic biology as a product or they're enabling technology, some sort of platform that helps you as researchers or as other companies to do synthetic biology work. Um, so the ones I found interesting, so Synlogic, um, which is uh, co-founded uh, co by Collins and Liu, um, which is engineered bugs to treat disease, and it's combining microbiome research with some synthetic biology to try to figure out a way to use a bug to kind of go in your gut and treat disease directly as opposed to having to uh, use medicine for that. Um, Genomatica did a 1,4-GT-dial production process with a, a sugar feedstock, and it's kind of, I know other Groups are working on similar kind of metabolic engineering processes here, so it's kind of cool to see it commercialized by someone. Um, and then, of course, synthetic genomics was there, and they had this, uh, they kind of had a demo of their DNA printer, which would basically streamline DNA production for basically anyone who's right now buying it from an outside company. And then Ginkgo Bioworks um, actually did a half hour talk on the last day, and they were um, coming up with a foundry for custom organism design and prototyping. And so, if any of these interest you, um, there's also, again, a list in the program of all the other companies that spoke. Um, but it's just a, you know, example of all the different technologies that can come out of the research that we're doing here. Um, and then uh, my mini research talk. So this is actually a poster I stumbled upon while waiting to talk to a slightly more relevant poster that I thought was actually <laughs> really cool. And, and not that they're not relevant, but it's, um, I th thought it was a really cool example of kind of where Symbio can go outside of the areas that you normally hear about, like um, medicine and you know biotechnology and all that, where it was a collaboration between civil engineering ar architects and synthetic biology at Newcastle University that was trying to find a way to uh, basically engineer uh, E. coli to sense pressure at kind of moderate, um, you know, they've been a lot of testing at like really high <coughs> and low pressures, but kind of a moderate normal pressure um, for a construction material. So you can Imagine if um, you can feel loading from a house or a pillar, and if for some reason that starts sinking um, and you're feeling more pressure, the bug would detect it and synthesize some sort of stabilizing uh, material to kind of help. And so it would be something that uh, we've talked a lot here before about like increasing the public and how GMOs are um, accepted or not accepted by people. So it's just kind of an interesting way to think about how Symbio can move outside of our normal purview and move into these other areas if the, uh, if the population is uh, accepting of it. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. Oh, and also, quick, quick note, uh, this was, I didn't know we had a lot of iGEM people here today, but this project was actually, and this whole website, symbio.construction.com, um, is, uh, was, sorry, inspired by an iGEM project that one of the guys who was an architect had read, and his wife was actually in my uh, Molecular biologists so got together and kind of did this whole thing. So, Hi everyone, I'm Eric. I'm in my Jewish lab. Um, so this is my favorite talk uh, by a researcher named Tom Alice at Imperial. If you don't know him, you should check him out. He has a really good Twitter feed. It really for some entertainment. I love his Twitter feed. Um, so this work is you may have heard of it, the synthetic yeast chromosome project SC uh, 2.0. And basically the goal, if you remember back in 2010, Craig Venter published the amycoides where they synthesized chemically an entire genome and got that into a cell. This is sort of the equivalent idea of vitamin yeast, um, which has a lot of uh, particular uh, interesting challenges. So 
Uh, back two years ago, uh, so this is a big uh, collaboration. I, I can't remember the number of universities, but basically each university and research group took a chromosome and they've been building them um, uh, throughout the years. So the first uh, published was chromosome three back in 2014. And what's kind of cool about this type of research is you notice there are 80 authors here. So a lot of these are undergrads um, who got to help construct these uh, big synthetic genomes. Um, so it's got kind of a cool like example of very large communities coming together towards one project to do something really cool. Um, and so why yeast? So they basically what they're doing instead of a total, so when Craig Venture did it, they did constructed the genomes uh, actually in yeast but outside of the organism they're running into, then got them into the organism. Um, in this way, they're just actually slowly converting the chromosome of yeast uh, by chunks. They just synthesize one mega chunk, integrate it, and then just step along until it becomes fully synthetic. Um, and whereas Craig Venters, they just took the known genome, copied it, and put that in. They're actually making a lot of cool like designs, changes to these genomes. Uh, first of all, uh, recoding all the TNG stop put on, so you may have been playing with E. coli, the train of E. coli, which are church and others. Um, took out all the TG stuff, but I'm to open up a 21st codon for non stent amino acid corporations. So this is the same idea by the yeast. Um, they also delete, deleting all the known transposons to make, basically make a very stable genome so it can't um, uh, switch around as much. Also, towards this idea of genetic code expansion, moving all the tRNAs to a dedicated new chromosome, which they're calling a neo chromosome. Um, and then adding what are called box P sites, um, basically, it's this method they call scramble, I can't remember what the acronym is for. Um, but basically the idea is these locked P sites um, and you add in another protein and they're able to like cut out random chunks of the genome as a way to optimize. So basically they put these locked P sites randomly in these chunks and then you can let evolution optimize your design um, for hope for better growth. Um, so in this, they're almost done with chromosome 11 um, so that's kind of cool. And just a little side note, what I what I also like about Tom Ellis is they're very, uh, I've seen him now speak twice, I remember he, Tom Ellis came to speak, I think it was like one or two years ago here in Northwestern. Um, he always talks about current research that's unpublished and always new stuff. So I think that's pretty rare. A lot of times you see talks where it's just, you, know, you see a three-year-old paper and you're just like, okay, why am I here and listen to this talk? This is all new stuff, which is really cool. Um, so I think it's a interesting challenge in the field where you have, um, sometimes people are very wary of presenting new data because of the fear of getting scooped, which is very real, um, but it's always refreshing to see someone who's very open and forthcoming with what they're doing. So that was great. Um, I'm going to second just talk about my other favorite session, which was the plants talk. Um, so in the uh, formal session, there's, another, there's a few student talks on plant work, but Beth Satley and Stanford and June Beth from Colorado State University were the two professors that talked. Um, Beth Sally's approach is, the idea is that plants make a ton of interesting bioactive compounds. A lot of our medicines come from the plant world. So let's try to first, you know, see what we can make, and part of that is discovering pathways. A lot of these pathways that make these interesting compounds are totally unknown, so there's this cool discovery aspect of her work. Um, and secondly, just also engine plant fitness, so towards um, agricultural applications, making more fit plants. Um, so it's kind of a cool melding of synthetic biology with metabolic engineering with this really cool, challenging system of plants. Uh, June Metford, a uh, really interesting talk. Uh, her, this is a quote from her, a little bit paraphrased, I can't remember the exact wording, but she basically was saying, we're doing what Chris Voigt did with circuits E. coli just 10 years later in plants. Um, her whole thing was, you know, these circuits that they're putting into plants, uh, they're very simple and they do work but they don't work very well, but it's in plants. It's a really, really hard system to engineer. So um, I thought it was really cool work uh, as well. Um, just that. But it, just as a more broader note, really conferences I've been to over the years, there's been more and more plant stuff, so I think it's really exciting. We were able to hear a lot more from in the future, so thank you guys. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Paul Carlson uh, from the Lux Lab. Um, Currently at Northwestern, but as of next week, we'll be here. Um, so it's really exciting to be here. Um, we have one Synbio lab at Cornell, so it's nice to see the one Synbio lab at a school. So, um, so I just want to talk quick about um, Dave Savage's talk. So, Dave Savage is a professor at UC Berkeley, um, and his lab is really interested in um, they have this nice system where they can build uh, libraries to study um, either split proteins or insertion proteins. So, they've used um, essentially a transposon system 
um, to study things like maltose binding protein <coughs> biosensors. Um, but as part of his talk, he was uh, talking about some recent work that was actually just published in Nature Biotech. Um, so if you, if you want, you can check it out there. But where they were looking at studying um, Cas9. And so essentially the way this experiment works is you take your plasmid encoding um, the protein you're interested in looking at, so Cas9 or Cas9, um, and then you just by PCR, uh, or sorry, not PCR, I'm using this transposon system, um, insert a transposon cassette, cassette with the resistance marker um, to give uh, a transposon library. Um, and from this, you can insert whatever domain uh, you're interested in looking at um, at pretty much every single site along the protein. And so this is a really nice um, way to easily look at large libraries of protein insertions. And so they first looked at this for uh, the PDZ domain. Um, and all this is showing is that uh, the sites where you see a positive bar, um, this is uh, enrichment of insertions at this site from the naive library. So these are all, in theory, sites that could be amenable to um, either making a split protein or an insertion protein. Um, and then conversely, these below are uh, downregulated in the um, library. And they show that this works really nicely for both DCAS9 um, as well as Cas9 for cleavage, and so you can see in red, uh, these were the sites which were most upregulated or enriched in their library, um, and they get almost um, native repression um, for cleavage. They then show that this works for um, an a estrogen receptor um, domain, and so what they did was essentially repeated this experiment, but with this as an estrogen receptor domain. E. coli, and so it's just a two-step selection where you first select for um, the domain with um, the antagonist, which in this case is 4-HT, and then do a second selection without uh, the 4-HT, um, and what that gives them is a uh, Cas9 with this inserted domain um, such that in the absence of 4-HT, you don't get repression, and then uh, upon 4-HT binding, the two ends of this domain uh, come in close proximity, which gives you a functional Cas9, and so it's a way of making an allosteric switch um, with Cas9 in a much simpler way um, than the sort of challenging approach. Um, so I thought that was really cool. He has a couple more papers, I think, coming out on different versions <coughs> of this technique, um, so I guess stay tuned for those. Um, and I just wanted to really quickly plug the Lux Lab. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with us, or, uh, or wasn't I see it if you Julia's talk, we are really interested in RNA, um, and so there are a couple different facets that we um, use RNA uh, for synthetic biology. Um, one is coupling uh, shape or chemical probing um, with next-gen sequencing to look at RNA structures. And so we can do this in vitro, in vivo, um, and there's some really exciting new work looking at transcriptional RNA folding. Um, so sort of the first um, forays into experimentally measuring how RNAs fold co-transcriptionally, um, which is really important for things like rapid switches. Um, we're also interested in building genetic parts, so libraries of orthogonal RNA regulators, um, as well as building new types of RNA regulators. So um, in this case, uh, we've engineered the first transcriptional activator, um, and sort of coupling these three areas um, to build complicated genetic circuits, hopefully. Um, so looking forward to being here, and I guess I'll pass it off to whoever is. No one. <laughs> <laughs> I can go. Okay. So I'm going to talk about two people that I would kind of fit into either biotechnology or biological machines. Um, and that's a postdoc from Ben Silver's lab, Jessica Polka, and then a professor from uh, the Technical University in Munich, Hendrik Dietz. And so Jessica Polka, she's using these proteins called R bodies that form these large covalent structures. It's two proteins. It comes from a mycoplasma that's an endosymbiote, uh, uh, a paramecium, so it's very esoteric. It's actually, what I really liked about this is, is there's reports of this as early as 1938, but there's not really been much study about the actual biochemistry of it. So these proteins form this large structure at high pH. It's kind of a sphere, and this is a pretty long sphere. Um, I wrote down the dimensions. It's something like up to a micron. So it's a very large sphere. But then at low pH, it kind of wraps up and looks, at least as far as I can tell, like a fruit roll-up. So um, there's this little fruit roll-up inside of a bacteria that's an endosymbiote, and then when the pH 
she has higher, it spears uh, and is able to, for example, rupture membranes. So you can imagine, and they're developing it for um, endosomal escape hub to be useful to break membranes in a pH sensitive way. They're looking at mutant cell this, they're looking at characterizing it, and I thought it was a really cool paper. It was just released um, in ACS Synthetic Biology, so um, I'd recommend looking into this uh, if you're interested in it. Her name is Jessica Polka. So the other professor, uh, the other talk was from a professor at the Technical University of Munich, Henrik Dietz. And he's, his background is DNA origami, so these are large, um, usually designed DNA structures that are able to take advantage of what we know about watson crick face pairing to make large DNA structures. So if you think about, um, if you're familiar, at least I'm a chemical engineer, so we think about porous materials, you're able to make very large porous materials that are very chemically defined using DNA origami. So that was all cool. He showed like these Legos that he was able to fit different Lego pieces and stack them in a very specific way using um, using uh, what's that called in the, when you get the base stacking interaction. Um, he was able to make um, what I would call transformers that are magnesium sensitive, so they would assemble into a transformer and then disassemble into the individual pieces. Um, they didn't look like cars when they disassembled, so don't get your hopes up yet. Um, he also was able to make them do things, like at, at least at this point, the, the transformers can only do the elementary backstroke, but um, <laughs> that is technically, I think, a machine, so that's really cool. And then something, those are all published, but something that he presented, and kind of to echo what Eric said, um, something that he presented that was unpublished that seems like, um, again, you're putting yourself out there for people to um, start doing before necessarily you've been accepted, is he was combining DNA origami with those tail proteins that, um, I forgot who was talking about the tail proteins, but anyways, these are DNA binding proteins that you can design. They can wrap around DNA um, through the major groove. It looks kind of like a boa constrictor tightening around DNA. And he was using that to build these structures and help to kind of direct the assembly of DNA origami using proteins that are DNA binding specific. So it's, at least for me, the first really instance that I've seen of large DNA structures, DNA protein structures that are pretty much pure, um, very uh, atomically defined. He was showing cryo-young structures and you could really see um, relatively near atomistic level definition of these large protein DNA structures. Um, so again, that person was Henrik Dietz from um, the Technical University of Munich. And I'll hand it over to uh, the last two speakers. Um, all right, so I'm going to echo what a couple people said. There was a lot of stuff about Cas9. Stuff that I really thought was cool about Cas9 was a lot of the industry-sponsored Cas9 stuff that's getting a lot more traction now. So I talked to a bunch of companies who are trying to figure out new ways to deliver Cas9 to cells. Um, a lot of people trying to use AAV viruses or another delivery method. Um, but one talk, Rachel Harowitz from Caribou Biosciences gave a really cool talk about guide RNAs and how to specifically choose a guide RNA um, so that you could get repairs that would correct a disease or a, correct, a cut in a defined location to correct a disease phenotype. And so she showed these really cool gels about how you could choose different guide RNAs that had very specific cut sequences. Um, and how you could, they were very reproducible across cell types and across different organisms, which is really cool and something they didn't expect. Um, so they're using these things to very accurately choose the guide RNA for the specific application so that they know exactly where it's going to cut and what the uh, most likely uh, repair, mechanism, repair mechanism is going to be on the DNA. So that was really cool. Uh, the other one I would like to highlight was something um, that a lot of people uh, encounter, but a lot of people don't study. So Domatia Del Vecchio from MIT, she studied what happens when you basically have two plasmids in the same cell. You know that they're sharing resources such as RNA polymerase, but a lot of people haven't studied exactly how that happens and how one may, might titrate RNA polymerase away from another circuit. Um, and so she was really looking at computational-based methods to try to accurately predict how you could put two circuits into one cell and how to predict the levels of expression you're going to get from each of those circuits based on which one's going to 
titrate more RNA polymerase away from the other. So that was just a really cool thing that everyone knows happens and is a lot of the reason why we can't move parts in between different circuits quite easily, um, but a lot of people haven't studied yet. Cool. And also, I have notes on like every single speaker, so if people have stuff that they want to hear about, let me know and I'm happy to talk about anything that anyone wants to hear. Um, so I was also at the conference and I just wanted to highlight kind of the first keynote speaker that I thought was quite interesting. It was Roy Marzib from the Wiseman Institute and his talk was Programmable On-Ship DNA Compartments on Artificial Cells. So he talked about making these um, 2D, 2D silicone chips and the challenges that come with trying to create proteins on them and the challenges of like encapsulation and in and out transport and turnover. And to solve this, he um, put DNA brushes kind of on the surface of these chips um, using UV lithography to localize these DNA brushes to the chips. And then based on the geometry, um, there's different compartments on these chips and through diffusion, um, he was able to synthesize proteins and then evacuate them through these little capillaries in kind of a steady state expression way. Um, and so with this geometry and different reactions, he just kind of described how this all happens on a chip. And I thought it was pretty cool. He used cell-free systems and just kind of creating everything on the chip and not in cells. That was kind of an interesting way to open up the uh, seminar. So that's really all I have to say. Thank you.